So let's back all the way back up now. On day three of creation, God creates three things with 27 words. And in those three things, God has placed the potential for all the sins of mankind in the form of a fruit tree yielding fruit whose seed is in itself. So then in Genesis chapter 3, Eve sees and she has the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. She sins. Adam sins. God has already worked out his plan of salvation for them even before they sinned. God had it all fit. God didn't go, oh, now what am I going to do? I don't know. What, what are we going to do? They sinned. I, I didn't plan it. That's not God. The Bible says that Jesus, as the lamb, was slain from the foundation of the world. It was always God's idea that Jesus do this. All right? To bear the iniquities of mankind. Seen in the number three. So the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, falls upon Adam. Adam third son Seth is where we all came from through Noah and his three sons Shem, Ham and Japheth Christ came specifically I mean generally the salvation is for the whole world but specifically to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob those three the third son of Jacob being Levi Levi was the tribe of the priesthood. Leviticus is the third book of the Bible. It has 27 chapters in it, foreshadowing of the New Testament, three times three times three. So we make it all the way down to the beginning of the New Testament, which is the 930th chapter of the Bible because Adam lived 930 years. And oh, by the way, 900 is divisible by 3, 30 is divisible by 3, so we know the number 930 is also divisible by 3. The books of the Old Testament are 39, which is a multiple of 13 times 3, which is basically seen in, I didn't cover this, but the first commandment given by God in Genesis chapter 2, where God told him not to eat of that tree, he says 39 words in the King James Bible there, 13 times 3. I mean, you, just, you can't beat it. So here we have Jesus born, and when he's 30, he's declared to be the one, the lamb, who's going to take away the sins of the world. And then three years later, at Passover time, he's sold for 30 pieces of silver, and he's placed on Golgotha, which is mentioned three times in the Bible. And he's got a cross on one side and a cross on the other. So we know there's three crosses on the hill of Golgotha. And the Bible says that he was numbered with the transgressors. I wonder what number that would be. It's the number three. So now that you know that, let's look at some things. That, the reason why I'd like to teach these numbers is so that as you're reading the Bible, when you see a list of three things in it, or you see three things in the Bible, or you see, you know, three words mentioned, or what uh, somebody's age, or they're holding three things in their hand, or whatever. When you see three armies coming, okay? The reason why I teach this is so that you can have this in your mind as you're reading scripture and you count something and you go, that matches perfectly with what the Bible teaches about this particular number. I want you to love this Bible the way I love this Bible. I love this Bible. It's the real genius behind this whole ministry, not me. Okay? God's word is the star here. Okay? I love that. So let's go back and look at some typology. We have the name Shiloh mentioned in the Bible, King James, 33 times. So think about that. Shiloh, do you know what Shiloh was? Shiloh was the first capital of the people of Israel. When they came into the Promised Land, they had not established Jerusalem as their capital. Where they set the tabernacle was 
at Shiloh. So the first, once they came into the land and they're permanent residents now, they picked the city of Shiloh to be the first place where the Ark of the Covenant is going to rest. Jerusalem is the second. Anytime you have one and then two, we covered this on the last video, you have, you could see like the first and second coming of Christ. And that's exactly what you see in the number of times the number, the word Shiloh is in the Bible, 33 times. Christ was 33 when he died, you know, in the midst of three crosses there being sold for 30 pieces of silver numbered with the transgressors. So let's look at it. In Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Notice the Bible now is calling Jesus Shiloh. Until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now what happened to Shiloh? Jeremiah 26, 6 tells us, then will I make this house like Shiloh and I will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Here's what happened. They established the capital at Shiloh, so Shiloh is going to be a picture of the first coming of Christ. Thirty-three times Shiloh is mentioned. Shiloh is the name of one of the names of Jesus given to us in scriptures. But because of the massive amount of sins the people of Israel committed, God destroyed Shiloh. Okay? Now think about it. Thirty-three and it's because of their sins that God had to destroy it. Oh, by the way, the second capital of the Isra you know, Israelites is Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is mentioned 667 times in the Old Testament. Add those two together. 700. Seven for God's perfection, the, the 700 or 100 or 10 or 1,000 represents dominion, the kingdom, because both of these are, especially Jerusalem, is a foreshadowing of Christ's kingdom, his 1,000 year reign. Isn't that beautiful? Shiloh being a picture of Christ, that's Christ's first coming, and it's done away. There's no more Shiloh. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. So Jerusalem then, re the second capital, represents the permanent capital of God's people. And it's foreshadowing new Jerusalem coming down from the heavens in the new heaven and the new earth. Okay? And I, I just love this, I love this study. By the way, I, I, I didn't mention this. I don't have it in my notes. Here we have Eve, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. She failed that test. The same devil came to Jesus in the same way with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Okay, the lust of the flesh in the form of the, hey, you can turn stones to bread, can't you? Okay, the lust of the eyes. See all these kingdoms? I'll give them to you if you'll worship me. The pride of life. Oh, you're so special with God, right? You can cast yourself down off this cliff and the angels have to come down and bear you up. See it? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. But Jesus didn't sin. He was the spotless sinless Lamb of God, but upon him he bears all the sins of mankind. Now, let's go back here. Luke chapter 22, verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Twelve is a multiple of three. Did you know Judas' name is mentioned exactly 33 times in the King James Bible? John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but who? The son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's what I said. Why is the beast called the man of of 
sin. Because he is the fruition. He is what we get for being sinners. He is going to be the cruel authority that God places over all mankind because of man's transgressions and not because of his, his obedience. Oh no, because of his man's sins, God gives a beast to rule over him. The Bible calls him the son of perdition who Judas was a foreshadowing of the man of sin because he's the only one in the whole Bible called the son of perdition and his name is mentioned 33 times in the Bible. Think about it, okay? The man of sin bearing this number. And here we see David, a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ because David is, we know that Judah is the 23rd generation from Adam. You can count that. And in Ruth chapter 4, these are the generations of Perez. Perez begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Aminadab, Aminadab begat Nashon, Nashon begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David, who is the 33rd in the lineage from Adam. And in fact, the Bible, I, I just thought of this, uh, this just in from heaven, in Ezekiel, let's see, Ezekiel 37. I uh, probably will take too long to find it, but you find it. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the Bible prophesies that the king is going to rule over them again, King David. Of course, we know it means Christ, but in Ezekiel 37, he's called David. And, of course, Jesus is the son of David, and David was the king of the Jews. How old was Jesus when they wrote that above his name, king of the Jews? He was 33 years old, and here is David, who is the 33rd in line from Adam, who is a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the king of kings and lord of lords. Mm -mm -mm. Now, notice this about David. Remember, David wanted to build a house for God, right? It's a good idea, because remember where it used to be. It used to be in Shiloh. Shiloh mentioned 33 times in the Bible. Shiloh is destroyed. So David wants to move it to Jerusalem, but God won't let him build a temple. Why won't God let David build a temple, a tabernacle, a house for God? Something wrong with his hands. 1 Chronicles 28, 2, Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build an house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build an house for my name because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Now think about this. The Bible teaches us in Colossians that Christ took all of our enemies that were against us and nailed them to his cross, making Christ's sacrifice on the cross not, a, not an act of uh, suicide, but an act of valor in a time of war. Because Jesus then took all of our enemies, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the crown of thorns, the king that rules over us, right, which is sin, Christ took those upon himself, all of our sins, and in the battlefield of Golgotha, mentioned three times in the Bible, destroys the power of our enemies that are against us by dying, by killing them in his death. So remember, Jesus, 33 years old, David is the 33rd in line from Adam, and David can't build the house of God because David is a man of war. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 11, And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. So, think about it. The crucifixion of Christ on the cross is the finished and by the way, what were, what were the last words of Jesus on that cross? It is finished. 
Pure Bible Search software, download it. Type in the phrase, it is finished. It's only found one other place in the whole Bible. It says, when lust, I can't remember the place, but lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin when it is finished. Bringeth forth death. Notice there's three things there. And it says, it is finished. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. When Jesus said, it is finished, what happened? He died. He gave up the ghost. That's one of those other reasons why I believe the King James Bible is the word of God. Anyway, back to David. David is a type of Christ at his first coming. Christ cannot build the house of God, the temple of God, at his first coming because the purpose of his first coming, as seen in David, is to be a man of war and to put down all of the enemies so that there could be peace. So David's not allowed. David, 33rd from Adam, Jesus, 33 when he dies in Golgotha. David can't build the house for God. So he dies. So his son, Solomon, who represents the second coming of Christ, because Solomon was a thousand years before Christ. Solomon had, this is not good, but Solomon had, how many women did he have? He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's 1,000. Okay? You could see that as maybe, let's pretend they're all like one wife. That's Christ and the church ruling and reigning for 1,000 years. That's when the temple is going to be built. But Christ at his first coming, seen in David, who's got blood on his hands, cannot build the house of God because he's the one going to put down all the enemies. Then they can get rest from all of their enemies. Now notice Judges chapter 16. This kind of sticks out to you. I have 3,000 men and women underlined there because Judges chapter 16 is a foreshadowing of, a, of Christ who at his death destroys all of our enemies in the form of a man who defeated all of his enemies in his death. And the Bible just happens to give you the number of those enemies. 3,000 men and women. It's the story of Samson. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand, of the other with his left. Stop right here. He's got a cross on one side, a cross on the other side, one on his right, one on his left. He's the one in the middle. Do you see that? You see what he's doing? Anyway, Verse 30, I like it, verse 30, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Six words here, one, two, three, four, five, six, three times two, and he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein, so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Again, was it an act of suicide? It's an act of bravery and valor above and beyond the call of duty as Jesus takes our enemies that are against us and in taking his own life or allowing his life to be taken, he destroys the enemies. It's like, it's like a guy fighting for his country and he's holding or he's stepping on the landmine and he knows that he's dead. His foot's still on the landmine and he stands there and he says to all of his fellows, go around me, go around me and I'm going to wait till you're gone then I'm going to call the enemy over to me and when they come over to me, I'll take care of them all because he knows what he's going to do. He's going to step off that landmine. 
an act of bravery, an act of valor in giving up his own life, destroying the enemies, and letting his men. What did Jesus say? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We have stories of great heroic ventures by men and women, and, and even of service dogs, who in the line of duty took down the enemies so that his fellows and his countrymen could live. Jesus was the greatest of these because he destroyed the very enemy that's going to destroy us all, and that is death. And notice that the 3,000 men and women, they're not just around him. They're above him, over his head, like the crown of thorns. And when he brought down the two pillars like the two crosses on each side, they all died at the same time. The dead which he slew in his death were more than what he killed in his life. And that's a picture of Christ. Here's another one. I love this one. Judges chapter 6, verse 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. That's Christ. And Abiezer was gathered after him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him, and he sent messengers unto Asher, and unto Zebulun, and unto Naphtali. Uh, stop right here. So we have three enemies, Midianites, Amalekites, children of the east. That kind of makes me think of the kings of the east, right? We have three enemies, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, and they're gathered against us, and we're going to lose. But Gideon, who's a picture of, of Christ, he blows the trumpet. And when he, when he blows the trumpet, let's see. We have uh, Abbey Ezer, who comes to be with him. Then we have Manasseh. Then we have Asher. Then we have Zebulun. And then we have Naphtali came up to meet with him. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain. You see, the number five is the number for the translation or the rapture. And right here, when Gideon blows the trumpet, five groups come up. And uh, let's see, what does it say? They came up to meet them. It's a picture of the rapture, people. I love it. Judges chapter 6, verse 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, so in Judges 7, by the 300 men that left, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, let all the other people go, every man unto his place. Look at this. So the Midianites, the Amalekites, the children of the east are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And you can't beat them. You've tried. You can't stop them from destroying you. But Jesus can, and by 300 men, it's like the three crosses, or Jesus being 33, or the 30 pieces of silver, or however you want to look at it, these represent sin that are defeated by the great captain, Jesus Christ. In verse 10, it says, The children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, and the Israelites couldn't destroy them, so we have these three armies that are against God's people and Jehoshaphat knows that there is no way in the world that they're going to come out of this alive. No way. Best thing I ever did. And I even asked, I was saved at nine, but what I've learned, I believed Christ was my savior at nine years old, but what I learned about that wasn't until later on in life because I thought that I could handle my own sin problem. Oh yeah, I know Jesus died for my sin so I don't have to take the punishment, but I thought that I could beat it on my own. I thought I could just stop sinning. If I just read enough positive reinforcement books and you know, listened to some positive sermons, you know that I found out I couldn't. I realized that still without Christ, I was a dead man. 
There was no way around it. Jehoshaphat realized that, fortunately. I mean, just like with Gideon. Those 300 men that stood with Gideon, they didn't fight. God let all those enemies destroy themselves. Same thing happens here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We have the Moabites, Ammonites, and the Edomites, and God lets them destroy themselves. The children of Israel didn't fight. Because he says here in verse 12, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. You've been there, haven't you? I have. You got so deep, you just, I don't, God, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm not going to make it. Okay? But you realize that you had no power, no might against them whatsoever. So here's the gospel. Here's the good news against the three that you can't beat. It says in verse 15, God sent word through the prophet, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God. Even though it was man's sins, man doing what God told him not to do, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. God, he knew this even before the beginning. God had already set up a way that even though it was our transgressions and our enemies, God was going to fight them for us. You see, I, I, there's a reason why I do what I do. You hear me tell all the time, if I see these guys with a crew cut or I see these guys wearing these army or navy or marines hats or whatever, I know they've served in the military. I go to them, shake their hand. You know, I've never had any of these guys say, I don't need your thanks for that. They all are very, some with tears in their eyes, appreciative, thanking me that I think from that. I had one guy ask me, did you serve? Oh, did you serve? And I said, no, I can't serve. That's why I like to go to the guys who did serve and tell them thank you, remembering also the ones who didn't come back because I couldn't serve in the military. You know, physically, my body's never been army material. But I think emotionally, too, I'm not really that kind of soldier. But the guys who did serve, that's why I'm very thankful. Because they did something for their country that most of us couldn't do. See, the battle really isn't ours. It's God's. So we let God fight it. And God already fought it when God fought it at Golgotha. So, three crosses, 33 years old, 30 pieces of silver, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. What happened three, and the last three words, it is finished, what happened three days later? See how it connects together? I love these stories. There's another one, Joshua chapter 12. We have the kings of the land and we have in verse 2, Sion king of the Amorites. We know he was a giant. Uh, and Joshua chapter 12, verse 4, uh, Og, king of Bashan. And we know, verse 6, then, them did Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel smite. So before Moses died, they have to deal with Sion king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, two giants, and Moses and the Israelites killed them. So that's two of the enemies down. And I want you to get this picture. Before we can inherit the inheritance, before we can get the promised land, there's kings that have to be defeated, enemies that have to be destroyed. Sion and Og were two of those enemies. But we're not done. So now we have a whole list Starting in uh, Joshua chapter 12, verse 7, Joshua and the children of Israel smote. So starting in verse 9, the king of Jericho, the king of Ai, and I won't read all of these, but you get down, verse 23, the king of Dor in the coast of Dor won, the king of the nations of Gilgal won, the king of Tirzah won, all the kings 30 and 1. So we have Moses killing Sion and Og, that's 2, and then we have if I had 31 fingers, I'd stick them up. Joshua killing 31. 
So 31 plus 2 is, I never, I'll never forget when I counted this up one day. I went, oh, those are the kings, those are the enemies that are against us, and we cannot inherit the promised land until they're defeated. And Moses and Joshua killed 33 kings. Mm. Then we have 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered with all his hosts together, and there were 30 and 2 kings with him. Let's see. So we have Ben-Hadad, then we have 32 others. How many does that make? 33. Notice, I've, you've heard me talk about this before, but in the, now you understand this number, 33. And why Masons use it. It's speaking of their king. Notice the emblem here. The 33 emblazoned, double-headed eagle, shows that he is from uh, heaven and earth together. The two combined in one body, but they're not cleaved together. That he's a king because of the crown. And notice under the, on the right-hand side, this is from Morals and Dogma, the two wings sticking out. That, of course, shows a spirit being instead of a human or a earthly beast or king the two wings sticking out there are 32 stars here plus the king making 33 th that's exactly what's in the bible one king with 32 kings with him 33 total and what do they represent the man of sin the son of perdition okay and oh by the way Ben-Hadad, I love this story. Ben-Hadad and the 32 kings says, we're going to kill every one of them there Israelites. Okay, so the first battle they fight is a hill. Notice verse 23, their gods are the god of the hills. In verse 28, the Lord is the god of the hills. So the first battle, get this, the first battle they fought, the 33 that they fought, they got beat. Where did Jesus defeat our enemies? Golgotha, which is a hill. Right? It's a hill. A little side note here. Samson. He is uh, he's in a city, and the Philistines surround the city, and there's two iron gates that hold everybody in or everybody out of the city. And they surrounded the city and they'll say, we'll catch him when he comes out and we'll kill him. When Samson finds out, they're thinking, oh, these two iron gates, they're going to prevail against him. Samson just takes them both and puts them on his shoulder and he walks up on top of a hill. Because the gates of hell did not prevail against him and he stood his ground on that hill. That hill... It's a picture of Calvary, Golgotha. And so the first battle that the 33 kings decide to fight against God is on a hill. And they lose. And they're all drunk and they're saying, well, you know, their gods are the god of the hills, but our gods are the god of the valley. So guess where they're going to try to fight him next? Because that's what it says. The Lord is the god of the hills, but he is not god of the valleys. So, on the seventh day, they decide to go to a valley and fight against God, and they lose there, too. The first battle was fought at Golgotha, a hill. And our God is the God of the hills. The second battle that they're going to fight is in a valley called Armageddon. But our God is also the God of the valleys as well. See these symbols? What you have with, oh, let's see the Japanese flag. The sun, the red sun, and you have white and red rays coming out of it. There's 32 rays coming out of it, the sun being the 33rd one. The Jesuit symbol. Notice the sun symbol, the black sun. Think about that because it's the black pope. And uh, coming out of it are 33 waves or 32 waves, 16 straight, 16 wavy. It's like a combo thing, right? Um, straight is not wavy and wavy is not straight. So you have 
they, the fourth kingdom, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what that symbolizes. But there's 32 of them with the black sun, 33, like the black pope. United Nations logo, there's 32 sections that the earth is sectioned off in. And the 33rd place is the north. I'm going to do a video on that here coming up soon. The 33rd point is the middle point at the, at the north. The United Nations logo is not the true and correct map of the flat earth. It shows something way more sinister. They've divided up the earth to give to the one whose number is 33, the one that Jesus defeated at the cross, the man of sin, the son of perdition. In the Sephiroth, Hebrew mysticism, the tree of life, it's not really the tree of life because it has opposites in it. It's more like the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge of good and evil represented lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, right? Take a look at this Sephiroth. Notice that on the outside you have two pillars, one on the right, one on the left, but you have a third one in the middle. Three pillars, three crosses, man of sin, the son of perdition, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. You have ten circles but you have 22 paths that connect them all together with a 33rd hidden circle. Notice there on the right, you actually have it characterized. The, the pillar on the left is the father. The pillar on the right is Shekinah, the goddess, the fertility goddess, that they say Yahweh procreates with Shekinah, which produces their Messiah. Their Messiah is none other than the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Because when the ten circles, which are the ten kings, the ten toes, the ten horns, combine with the 22 amino acids, which are the 22 Hebrew letters, which are the 22 paths, when you add 10 to 22, you get 32. And that's what produces the 33rd. You see how this all works together? You see, Jesus defeated that on the cross. Okay, the beast is coming. The beast is coming. But he's defeated already by the one who was 33 who died. You know, you get the whole thing. Isaiah 28, here's another 33 for you. Estamos bien en el refugio los 33. Do you know what that, is, that means? We're all doing okay in the refuge, signed the 33. It's in reference to the 33 miners. When I saw this story first come out, I went, why 33? And wait a minute, they're in a pit. And if you notice this, the coordinates of the Copiapo mine in Chile, 27 degrees south latitude, 27 is 3 times 3 times 3. They have 33 miners. They spent 33 days exactly drilling for them. And they estimated a total of 33 hours to get all 33 miners out. An hour per miner. That makes sense, right? 33 and 33 and 33 and 33. Because the pit represents hell. And that's where the beast is right now. Notice Isaiah 28 because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. Hell, the covenant that they have with death and hell is basically a covenant with the Antichrist. The one who's marked with the number 33 because he's the man of sin. He's the king with the 32 other kings. Those 33 miners trapped down in a pit were destined to be let out. And I remember the day that I found out they were going to pull these miners out with a capsule specially designed for this that they called the phoenix. The phoenix, of course, is the bird that dies in the fire and is resurrected from its own ashes. They did this deliberately. Now, I'm not saying that they, the Illuminati, planted these 33 men and then made this giant boulder to come crashing down on top of them and trap them down in there for 69 days, 33 days of drilling, 33 hours to get them out, and there was exactly 33? Come on, man didn't do that. But what that to me was showing, principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places, to me they're letting the world know 
guess who's coming? The one who's trapped down in the pit, whose number, one of the numbers of him is 33, and he's represented by the phoenix. He's going to rise from his own death. You see, there it is, the 33, the phoenix capsule. And notice every one of them were given these custom-designed T-shirts. There were 33 stars. Remember the logo that we saw earlier from Morals and Dogma? 33 stars. And here these guys come out wearing 33 stars taken out of a pit represented by the phoenix. So to me it's no marvel that the exact phrase, the beast, is mentioned exactly 33 times in the New Testament. Acts chapter 28 verse 5, and he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. That, that's the first New Testament occurrence of the word beast. He shook off the beast where? And what was on, it was on his hand. What was on there? A serpent. The beast, the dragon. And he shook off the beast because the beast is going to be cast into the lake of fire and be there forever and forever and forever the 33rd occurrence of the phrase, the beast, the devil that deceives them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. See, there are three in the lake of fire. The dragon, the beast, the false prophet, the beast being mentioned 33 times. See, Christ did it. Christ did it at Calvary, at Golgotha, what none of us could do against our own sins. He defeated our enemies. Not only did we not, could we not fight, we didn't have to. God just kind of said, go over here and stand and sing praises to me and talk about the sword of the Lord and worship me while I go kill all your enemies for you. By the way, that story in Second Chronicles you know how many days they were collecting all the jewels and the gold and the weapons that they had, the three armies had? Three days. That's resurrection, by the way, after the death on Golgotha. I love this. I love this. And you could then take this, go back to the Bible, places that I've not talked about here, Find things that I've never seen in the Bible related to the number 3 or 33 or 300 or 30 or 3,000, maybe? You'll find things in the Bible you never knew were there. Or things that you've read before now. It makes sense. So that's why I like doing things like this, is to help you see the Bible in a way you never saw it before. So that you'll believe it so that you'll worship the God that wrote it because it's his word okay I'm just the messenger the spokesman and I love being that hope you get a blessing from this we'll talk about another number next week or we'll talk maybe about the north I don't know we'll see where God leads us but I promise you this if we get it from God's word it'll be worth the journey God bless you I love you you're the reason why we do what we do We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.